the start already. So I think this was two days ago. Two days ago I had a, a weird dream. And of course, if you haven't kept up with some of my videos, Ryan and I get uh, some crazy dreams from time to time. But this dream wasn't really, I truly don't believe, and I know for sure after praying about this for two days, I don't uh, believe this was a, a demonic nightmare dream. When I woke up from this dream, this is actually a, a way of God speaking to me. So, this is on, I think this was yesterday that happened. Yeah, it was yesterday. Yesterday around, I think, 3 or 4 in the morning. So, in the first dream, I had actually two dreams, but the first one wasn't really, uh, wasn't really a dream, like a nightmare. I guess it was somewhat of it. It's pretty messed up at first. So the first dream I had was just me and Mariah fighting, and I was wondering, like, why are we fighting? And I didn't even know what was going on. I was just watching, I, I guess, a version of myself. And I see somebody, like, it's pretty twisted. I don't, I, you know, you know, this isn't from me or her. It's not really a twisted mind, but who has a dream of someone, someone and their fiance or their spouse getting shot in the head? That's weird. Uh, it's messed up. I know that wasn't really from me, but the second dream is when it got weirder. So Mariah and I are fighting, and supposedly she gets shot in the head and you know it, it stirs up an anger in me and and after praying i've seen uh well from john ten ten, the enemy likes to come steal kill and destroy and we don't there's no bad thoughts before we sleep uh there's no wicked thoughts like that i mean who would even think about someone your spouse or your fiance getting shot in the head that's messed up and in the dream i guess i wanted revenge uh I mean, what person wouldn't want that? But I had to refrain and I had to realize, wait, maybe this isn't real. That's not really the dream I want to talk about, though. Because I woke up after that and I was praying, wondering, why did I even have that? And that's where God had to show me it's it wasn't you. It was a way of the enemy, like, showing me the enemy likes to come, steal, kill, and destroy. Um, and how ironic is that? It's, what day is it? The 29th today? Uh... So it'd be two days till Halloween. And I'll talk about that right now. But I need you to understand the dream first. Then later on I wake up. Uh, I go back to sleep. Then I have another dream. And my other dream is uh, me and my uncle. One of my, my aunts, my Theo, my Theo, whatever. And uh, I'm reliving a moment of him giving me money for a venue. My venue for me and Mariah, our wedding. Uh, for another payment. But and then he starts to grab a mark, and no, this wasn't actually him. This I know it wasn't actually him. This is a God's way of using using other people that you know to speak to you. And he gives me uh, another two hundred dollars because they gave me they gave me uh, one of the payments from our venues to help us out uh, for our wedding after after the ceremony next year. So he gives me another two hundred dollars for the payment, and he starts to grab a marker, and he writes on my. He writes on my wrist, uh, right here. Uh, he starts writing a symbol, and I'm wondering, like, like, Roy, why do you, why are you writing a symbol? And I just pull away from it. But before I pull away from it, the symbol's not really complete. It's incomplete actually, and the symbol looks like this. And I want you guys to see this. Let me uh, fix this right now. So that's how the symbol looks. I don't know if you guys can see that. The symbol looks like that, right? So I've never seen the symbol in my life before. At all, at all. At all. So this is what he was writing in the dream. In the dream, he was writing this on my wrist. And I'm wondering, uh, I'm wondering what does that mean? And then later on, I wake up as I, I wipe it off because he's, in the dream, he used the marker. So I wipe it off and I'm rubbing it. It finally comes off. But also, uh, I wake up again and I start praying again. And I'm wondering... Like, why did I even have that? And it wasn't a nightmare because I used to have PTSD and it was a spiritual thing. I used to have a lot of it. So it, I know that wasn't a nightmare. I felt peace when I woke up and I was wondering, why did I even have that? So when I started praying, it's God's way of showing me. He's trying to tell me something. So that's why I was praying for the past two days, uh, yesterday and today. So this would be like day two. And I had the audio book from a paradigm from Jonathan Kahn explaining like the parallels of Jezebel and everyone now. Uh, so I was wondering like, 
Was it because I heard Jezebel? But I've never seen this picture in my life before. I've never seen the symbol. So why, do, why am I dreaming it? So I ended up looking up Jezebel's symbol. I was like, maybe it has something to do with that. And it didn't really match up. Then I start to, uh, I start to look up um, Ahab's symbol. And I was like, maybe it's because of that. It was a little bit closer, but it wasn't even as complete. It didn't look like it. So and then I, I think, wait, they both served Baal. And I look up, okay, Baal symbol. And then it gives me a seal of Baal. And it looks almost identical to this, a seal of Baal. So right now, if you're watching this, uh, wait till the video is done. But look, I need you to look back. If you have to rewind the video, look at this symbol. Go right now on your phone, laptop, whatever, and go look up the seal of Baal. You'll see it's not the lining, the alignment. It's like the alignment is right there. But the completion, because in the dream, this wasn't completed. When they're writing on, on my wrist, I... You know, I moved away my wrist and I wiped it off and it wasn't complete. So when you look up the seal of Baal on Google, whatever you have, it's a complete image, a complete seal of that. And then I'm wondering, why did I even have it in my dream? And I'm praying and praying and praying and I'm listening. And um, then I go back to the scriptures. I think in Genesis, that's one of the earliest ones where it talks about Baal. Baal was throughout almost the entire Bible, one of the most pagan gods used throughout the entire Bible, starting off with the Canaanites, one of the tribes uh, that went against Israel. But like, I'm just going to list of some of the stuff in the Bible that Baal has been known as, or even on when you do research in historical documents. Baal, Baal, uh, that's how you pronounce it. Uh, he was, his name means owner, lord, so you know, uh, I know he's, a, he's not, uh, he's not a, he's a like with a little l he's a false god so this is what all the other canaanites or all the other tribes that went against israel would worship or sometimes israel would allow this person or this false pagan god so they would they used to call him the, the universal god of fertility the lord of the earth the lord of rain and dew they used to call him the storm god they used to call him the lord of heavens they used to call him the sea god they used to even call him um they used to have his temple his false altar next to Dagon, the fish god back then, uh, during the time of Samson. And even uh, Baal was even known as Zeus, the the god of heavens, you know, Zeus from mythology. So you see, uh, compared to other gods, the, the false gods with a little g in the Bible, Baal was one of the most ones that they, they make examples of. And Baal always keeps on coming back into the picture, taking different forms. But we all know that who takes different forms, and that's uh, Satan, the devil, the enemy. So I'm wondering, why do I have this? And then I look back, and I had to pray before even making this video. And I see in uh, Revelation 13, of course, we're in the last days. I always mention this in all of my videos. So in the last days, there's going to be a falling wave of the elect, but also a restoration for uh, for other believers. So this is where God's going to separate the the gray and he's going to separate the black and white. There's not going to be any more gray areas. You can't be a lukewarm Christian during the, these last days where God's separating it. He's dividing it with the sword. As Jesus said, he didn't come to, to bring peace, but to divide with the sword. When he meant divide, he's going to divide his sheep, the people who want to follow him because they love him, compared to the other people who say that they want to follow Jesus and yet they don't. So when in the last days, where there's going to be a division of black and white. You're going to either be all out, all out for God, like you're going to be all out like you don't want to be a part of him and you're going to be all in there's there's one or the other black or gray there will be no gray areas as the time gets closer to him coming back so when it comes to that seal of Baal, that image as i saw it and looked it up and started going into more research started praying started looking more scriptures with Baal, and he's one of the most pagan gods that still lives on and takes different forms then who's to say he can't take different forms of our culture and of we what we've shifted if you go back and look at Jonathan Kahn's videos, his explanation of the paradigm, when the worship of Baal still lives through abortion, the worship of Baal still, you know how they had it back then in the times of Jezebel, where they would sacrifice kids, babies, children to Baal, to Moloch, and were different forms of Baal, building altars and worshiping him. And a lot of people think worshiping and bowing down is literally bowing down. You know, you can bow down with your life, your words, your decisions, what you do. So who's to say you're not bowing down when it comes to abortion? And I'm not trying to make it politically correct, but my, my point is there's a bell mark. As in Revelation 13, 
it says in Revelation 13, um, I think this is after maybe 15 or 16. I'm not sure with the specific verse, but just go around from 11 to 16 or around there. In Revelation chapter 13, that there is a, one of the verses says in the last days that we'll receive a mark for the ones who choose it. I mean, there will be no more forgiveness for it because you have that mark either cut on your uh, on your right hand, your forearm or whichever or on your forehead. Um, and I'm not saying that this is the exact mark. I'm not saying that. I'm saying there is a spiritual mark already going around as and as Baal represents Satan, there is already an antichrist spirit throughout the entire Bible. Paul talks about this. They most of them talk about this. In Thessalonians, it even says, aside from the antichrist being a uh, a spirit, yes, it's a person, but already with this symbol that I've never seen in my entire life. Just look at the seal of Baal. It's a complete symbol. This is an incomplete because I pulled away my hand before. As we see many lukewarm Christians taking that mark every single day, submitting and bowing down to not not the uh, the worship of Baal, not just that, but the ideology, the mentality of Baal. And and a lot of people take that mark, that mark every single day. Uh, they, they get that mark sealed upon them when they compromise, when you act in gray areas, when you're lukewarm, when you want to play Jesus for a bit, but then you also want to play part of the world. When you act in that way and you don't apply any of the scriptures to your life, you can quote them, you can share a bunch of Facebook quotes and all that, but you can't apply any of that. So then you'd rather receive the mark once in a while. And you're, you always allow Baal or allow whoever to mark that, that seal of Baal on you. When, you know, in, in, in the entire Bible where God even has... In the last days, I think it's in the beginning of Revelations where God seals. He puts a seal on us and that's salvation. When he has a seal on our forehead, that's salvation already. The enemy likes a copy and John 10, 10 likes to steal, kill and destroy. You're always going to be hearing that from me. But when he likes to steal, kill and destroy, he's the enemy likes you. He likes to copy the way God is. He likes to mimic him. He's an imitator because he has no patterns that match him up. And as I've read Jonathan uh, Kahn's, uh, his seen his videos, read some of his passages or, or part of his the information from his books, Irvin Baxter. And when I've seen John Ramirez, a spiritual warfare leader, a pastor that used to be an ex Satanist, when I was reading one of his books, I was actually on the section, I think chapter eight or nine, that the enemy has patterns. He's not even an original person. He has patterns that he has to repeat. He's repetitive. He's real repetitive, unlike God. God has everything original. So when you have repetitive stuff from the enemy and stuff like this, it's history repeating itself as they've talked about in, since Genesis in the Bible, since the majority of, of the entire word of God. So people are taking that mark every single day when you bow down with your mentality, your life, when you make everything politically correct, when you try to go all that. We're not trying to be politically correct. We're not trying to, when, when Christians say certain things, we're not trying to, uh, to make it about ourselves. We're trying to either warn you because every time someone says, whoa, in the Bible, or any one of the prophets or the disciples, when we say woe, W-O-E, woe means judgment is coming. And it's always a word of encouragement when I say that because you don't have to live like that. You don't have to go through any more depressions. You don't have to take this seal. And as you can see, this seal from this dream, it wasn't complete. Meaning you don't have to wait to, to take the complete seal of Satan when you can already just Get it off as I did in the dream. Mark it off your hand and get rid of it and just take the seal of God. It doesn't take that long to, to mark it off. And this is an, an analogy I'll use, in a, spirit, a spiritual analogy compared to a physical analogy. That's a seal of bail. So imagine you had the seal of bail like how they tried writing on my hand. I was wondering, what is this? So I, I take it away because it's not from God. And wash your hands. You have some Christians that can't even wash their hands spiritually, meaning you have so much filthiness and you don't want to give everything to Jesus. You don't want to use that soap to wash your entire hands. So you just say filthy and you just, you sh and you shake everyone else's hands. You're there shaking everyone else's hands and giving them that filthiness. And you're just sharing that filthiness when you can tell someone, Hey, we got soap, man, wash your hands. Or you want an another analogy? I was actually, this is what God showed me when I was driving, when I was driving on, um, uh, on my way to my nephew's football game, his little flag football game, I'm driving and as I get out of work and you know, every time a person, if you're a driver, any person knows this on the road, when it's our duty as citizens to, to, uh, you know, to turn off and on the lights, to flicker the lights when someone does, and it's the nighttime, it was like seven or eight in the night when someone doesn't have their lights on and they're driving in, why do we flick their, why do we flick our lights at that person? Because we don't want them to crash and we don't want them to crash. So we flick our lights and we shine it. 
Because in the car, you can't just say, hey, hey, turn on your lights. They're not going to hear you. They can't, you have to manifest and you have to show them through the light. So turn in, turning on and off, you got to turn it on and flicker it, get their attention. The same thing what I'm doing with you who people are on Facebook and just scrolling through all the comments, just scrolling through all the memes and social media and, and the politics and everything, making it about yourselves or making it about your own personal opinions. When I'm flicking the lights of you, you know, Jesus even said this to be the salt and the light and salt of the earth to all nations, the light and salt of the earth. So just like as in, uh, just like in a car when you're driving and you're flickering on that light to someone who doesn't have that light on, you tell them, hey, you need to turn on your light. I'm telling you right right now, I'm telling each and every one of you watching this, turn on your lights. I'm turning on my light and I'm telling you, turn on your lights so you can walk in the way of God. I don't want you to crash. Just like I don't want you to fall away to hell or just like I don't want you to fall away to depression in these last days. And I don't want you to take this seal, this seal of Baal. So why do I also mention it with Halloween? You want to know about Halloween? Back from Ireland or back in the 2000 years ago, if you want. In the rituals of Halloween. Some people back then in Halloween, they would have this spiritual mentality uh, that the demons or whoever, the evil spirits or demons, unclean spirits would come to the children of the family and they would dress themselves up as, as uh, they to dress themselves up like demons or costumes. And over the years, it's become, the culture has westernized it. Sometimes they used to use it as, tur as turnips, not pumpkins. But they would, um, it's just rituals that they would have to, to uh, trick those spirits. That's why it's called trick or treat. So, and that's not even the darkest thing about it. You know, this ex, this uh, ex Satan worshiper, John Ramirez, now is a pastor. Uh, for 25 years when he was a Satan worshiper, he says he even had his birthday on Halloween when he used to do Satan worshiping because a lot of people say it's a devil's birthday and but you can never explain that. Well, I'm gonna explain it to you without just saying it's a devil's birthday. I'm giving you an explanation. I'm, not, I'm giving you facts. I'm not just gonna give you an opinion. Satanists love this day. Satanists are, are people who worship Satan and all this. They love it when Christians, they love it when believers just celebrate it. Or when it comes to uh, harvest and just putting pumpkins outside the church, it's it's a disgrace to do that, man. Just outside because and it doesn't matter if you have a uh, innocent costume, an innocent costume, or just a costume like a Little Mermaid, a princess, or a Power Ranger, or whatever. Once you put on that costume. You give legal rights to the enemy when it comes to that seal. You take a spiritual seal over yourself and you give legal rights to the enemy. This is about territory when it comes to spiritual warfare. And when you're compromising and when you're in a gray area, you're still giving legal rights to the enemy. Now, I'm not trying to give him credit. I'm telling you, there is nothing that can compare to the power and the love of God. But when you're compromising, as God gave away the children of Israel because they compromised and they had the worship of Baal and they tried worshiping God at the same time, God gave them over to their enemies. And that was the children of Israel, the Jews who God came for first. So what makes us think that we have a better place than them? What makes us think we're better than them? So there's many things, the example that the Bible shows, and I'm going to show it to the people who probably uh, are making fun of me or whatever, and that's fine. I'm still praying for you. But... I want to say this from Proverbs chapter 30, because this is the wisdom that God gives to Solomon throughout the entire book of uh, Proverbs. So I'm going to start uh, chapter 11. There's a generation that curses their father and doesn't bless their mother. Uh, Proverbs 30, chapter, chapter 30, verse 12 now. There's a generation that are pure in their own heart, in their own eyes, and yet they're not washed from their filthiness. See, it goes with my analogy. And... Uh, verse 13, there's a generation, how lofty are their eyes and their eyelids are lifted up. And chap chapter 30, we're still in the same one. Verse 14, there's a generation whose teeth are swords and their jaw, their jaw teeth are as knives to devour the poor from off the earth and the needy from among men. So you see, even describes it as our words are the way we, even our words can be as swords. And it can be perverted, especially when we take that mark that spiritual mark upon our lives. But all you gotta do is just, hey, take control and wash it off and take the seal of God. Because if you're in a gray area, then what happens? You still compromise, you still, it's like you're basically asking for legal rights without even saying it. You gotta understand how this, how this stuff works. God doesn't play around. And he doesn't play around because, not because he hates you, but because he loves you and, and he hates sin and what it does to you.
And I'm not trying to say I'm better than anyone. I don't have to put this anymore. But I'll leave you with this, especially for these last days. When, it, when that time comes, you know, in Revelation chapter 13, verse 11, uh, it describes the Antichrist. It describes the enemy. And coming in the form of a lamb, we know Jesus as the lamb of God, but it says in Revelation 13, chapter, chapter 13, verse 11, as the enemy comes in a form of a lamb, but speaks like a dragon. Be careful what you're doing. Be careful what's disguised as a lamb. Be careful what's disguised as Christ, but speaks like a dragon. Is your life disguised as a lamb? And are you speaking like a dragon? Are you living like a dragon? And are you disguised like a lamb? So I ask that you not just try to only hear because I'm saying it. I say you just pray about it before even saying anything. And I think I should end off that video. Because I have to wake up early. And to be honest, I... And I'm not going to say that I keep everything on, on check. Uh, today in, at work or, you know, today I, when I had to pray, sometimes I feel like I'm too casual. Some, I feel like I'm too casual sometimes and I need to pray more. And, you know, some people would think I pray a lot, but you, know, you can never pray too much. We should focus on praying and not because just a casual prayer, like, all right, uh, just to pray like for five, ten minutes and then just head off without your day. I'm saying take time with God and get into his presence because it's extremely important. And the more you get into his presence, that's the key to getting through all of this. The more you get into his presence, the more you know him, and the more you're always around him. You just want to be like him. You just want to serve him. You just want to just be a servant. You know, when we get to heaven, he's going to say, uh, he's not going to say, well done, my beloved um, uh, apostle, prophet, pastor, whatever. He's going to say, well done, my beloved servant. So I'm not saying this out of anger to be making myself better than you guys. I'm saying this because... We're all supposed to be servants to one another. So I'm here to serve you and I'm here to help you. And just like I know you guys would probably help me in other situations, well, I'm helping you for your soul. And I'm helping you by giving you something that God would want to share with everyone, not to just keep to myself. It's like a cure for cancer. And I see so many people with spiritual cancer and physical cancer. You know what they both have in common is some of them don't even want to get help. Some of them don't even want to fight anymore. And it's a sad thing because I know some people on both sides on physical and spiritual cancer. And it, it really hurts me because sometimes I have to get up in the, middle, in the middle of the night and pray for them. But there's only so much. Yes, the prayers are powerful. But it, everyone, just like how God says, everyone has to work out their own salvation. You got to work out your own salvation. You got to love God yourself. You can't be just following it, following God in his ways just so you can have a get out of uh, hell or get out of jail or hell free card. So I'm challenging you, whoever's watching it, to either share the video, hate me, all right, at least tell me to my face, don't be hiding behind the screen, you know, tell me in person if you want to talk and have some civil dialogue, or if you want to, uh, if, if you want, you want any questions answered, whatever, and if you're going to ask me something, please, if you actually have a question, I've had so many people that, and I'm not going to call out anyone, I'm not going to call out anyone's name, I'm just going to say a random person that... Uh, supposedly, I'm not even going to say the title that they are in the church. I'm just going to say this random person that has asked me questions that they know the answer to. Why are you going to ask me a question? Don't be trying to test me, man. That's, that's stupid. I don't want to be tested. I'm trying to help. Uh, I want to be there to serve. I'm here to serve you guys. I'm not here to make myself smarter or better than someone else. So, um, you know, if, uh, you want any, if you want any of us to pray for you, or you, if you still need a church, or if you still need anyone else to, uh, answer your questions or whatever. You don't always have to go to me. We can refer you to someone else. You can come to me directly. If you just want to talk, you just want to chill or hang out, that's fine. But I need to go to sleep because I'm waking up early tomorrow before class and I have to finish writing uh, or typing out an essay on the existence of God for philosophy. I, it's a dumb thing. If I were to do it on my terms, oh my gosh, it'd be awesome. I'm doing it like Jonathan Connor, Irvin Baxter, but I can't. So I have to do it on the professor's terms. So that's pretty tricky. So, yeah, pray for me on that. Bye. Good night, guys.